All right, thanks, Chris. So um, I'm actually substituting for Tim Sheehan, who couldn't be here today, um, but uh, do the best I can. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel because uh, we're very close. As you heard earlier this morning, um, we have a system that's coming together down in Florida, um, and it's ready to go. So we'll be launching very soon, and that's going to be that critical first step to get us going. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel members. And what I'm going to do is a short introduction of each of them uh, and then let them give their overview talk. And then we'll come to some Q&A. And at the end, uh, just as uh, we have been doing, I'd like to encourage folks here in the audience, uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to come down to the mics and, and uh, we'll answer your questions. So without uh, any more preamble, let me go to our first speaker, Sheila Logan. Uh, Sheila's the Orion Program Executive and Artemis Integration Lead within the Common Exploration Systems Development Division at NASA Headquarters. Sheila. Thank you. Well, thanks, Joe. Um, you know, really uh, excited and happy to be here and uh, join in this discussion with my first, um, fellow panelists. Uh, just a little bit about me. I, um, uh, you know, really serve as a liaison between the Orion program out of JSC and headquarters, and also uh, am involved in a number of um, integration activities um, in preparation for Artemis One. So, um, and I'm also a fill in today actually for um, uh, Katria, who is um, actually supporting um, mission um, meetings with our international oh, yeah. partners in, in sure. France at the moment. So, uh, let's just go ahead and, and get started. I'm going to roll a video and, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about one and two. I guess I am controlling this. Can we roll the video, guys? Wonderful. Yeah, I'm sort of trying to drive <laughs> and talk at the same time. All right, so um, I think we all saw elements of the Artemis, um, not Artemis campaign or you know Artemis uh, infrastructure in that video, um, and and all of them are basically represented here. It's the crew transportation to to the lunar vicinity. It's the establishment of an outpost in the lunar vicinity. It's the broad range of surface capabilities that are going to be needed for for the lunar surface and and, and eventually the establishment of the base camp. Now, for purposes of, of this discussion, though, I just want to, I'm sorry, I think I should not be driving this. <laughs> Could you guys help me in the back, please? And let's tab forward one, one more, more, please. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. I think I, uh, I need to not drive. Okay. <laughs> All right, so for purposes of this discussion, what we're really talking about for Artemis 1 and 2 are the, the four highlighted um, programs. And so obviously we have our SLS rocket that will um, launch uh, the Ryan spacecraft into the lunar, um, really into the DRO. Um, we have our exploration ground systems. There are ops agent for ground processing, for launch ops, for recovery ops, and then and obviously there's a space communication and navigation 
uh, program. I mean, all our assets that are our ground assets, our satellites that are needed, in, including the deep space network that are essential, obviously, for um, deep space right. exploration. And so, you know, um, as Joe just alluded to, I mean, really the, the foundation of all the things, I mean, all the really great aspirational goals we're talking about really starts here, right? It's, if you were to think of, of, of what we're doing in terms of a relay, right, that first leg of the relay is getting us off the ground into the lunar vicinity, and that's, yeah. that's really your, your highlighted boxes here. Let's tab one. So, so for Artemis One, um, Really, the, the, this is a test flight, and so the, the primary objective here is to really test Orion, test SLS, test our ground our capabilities uh, in support of human rating. And to that end, um, our mission priorities are first to demonstrate the Orion heat shield at lunar yeah. reentry conditions. We're talking up to 5,000 degree Fahrenheit, and so um, yeah, we're not going to put crew on that vehicle until we've tested it. Right. <laughs> um, second, to operate systems in a flight environment, and then uh, our third mission priority is to retrieve the spacecraft and, um, and obviously allow the Orion teams to, um, you know, to validate their models against real flight data. And, and there are like sensors plastered all over the, the spacecraft um, collecting the uh, data um, for the duration of the mission. And then all the remaining uh, items are, you know, listed, all the remaining objectives will be, be uh, accomplished after that. And really they're, they're important. They're all very important, but um, they will be performed in the absence of systems failure because the primary objective here is really to, to get us to that place of um, human rating. Next slide. So, so this is the mission map. I think I, I have like a five minute allocation. I'm not gonna talk all of this. So I, I just wanna point out that, um, and I'm kind of squinting a bit trying to figure out the numbers, but really if you look at um, Milestone number six, you're really talking at that point of translunar um, injection when the, the SLS upper stage, the ICPS, when it fires, Orion will separate from the spacecraft, and at that point, you have the deployment of, of um, the CubeSats. I think you guys heard mention in the first panel that uh, there are two jacks of uh, CubeSats that are um, going to be flying on this mission. There are a total of 10 flying, and two of those are the, uh, the Omo Tanashi and Achilles. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you get what I'm saying. Yes. Um, and then once um, um, ICPS, uh, you know, performs its disposal maneuver and deploys its, its uh, CubeSats, uh, you're going to see the Orion uh, heading towards the, the uh, DRO, the D distant retrograde orbit. Um, for this mission, we're talking anywhere between six and 19 days in the DRO, just depending on, on when we launch. Um, and then uh, Ryan will perform a couple of maneuvers that will um, you know, allow it to benefit from a lunar gravitational assist and kind of slingshot it around the moon and head back um, towards the Earth. Um, because this is like our one shot at an uncrewed um, uh, mission with the Ryan vehicle, we're, you know, we're going to really test it to the fullest extent. Yeah. And so while uh, Orion is, is um, it's being you know, certified as a up to 21 day um, uh, capability for a crew of four. Uh, this mission will be anywhere between 26 and 42 days. So it's you know, really a robust uh, testing of the systems. Um, let's see, let's, let's go to the next slide. So uh, for Artemis II, uh, this is gonna be our, our first uh, crew test flight. Um, and the duration will be on you know, the order of 10 days or less. Um, you know, this will be the first time that the full suite of uh, environmental control and life support systems um, capabilities are going to be on board. Right. Uh, again, with Artemis One not being a crewed flight, there's really no reason to, to carry the full suite of things needed to sustain life in the, in the pressurized um, cabin. Um, and so they're showing up here first um, on this mission. You also see in the lower um, right corner of box there, uh, this is also um, What's different about this mission as compared to Artemis One is there's going to be a rendezvous um, um, prox op, um, ops um, demo that's planned, and and so a subset of the docking system capabilities that we'll see in Artemis Three will show up here. So this will be like the docking lights, docking cameras, and it's really just intended for the crew to, um, you know, to really test the manual handling capabilities. So really, you're talking commanding by the crew versus you know um, MCC or or the ground uh, flight ops team. Um, and so that's going to happen. So once um, you have, you know, your, your translunar injection, the um, burn, uh, Orion will uh, perform like a, a flyby 
um, by the moon and then head home. And so you're talking 10 days or less. So, um, you know, as Joe mentioned, um, this is this is really the foundational um, set yes. of missions, right? And so it's really right. important that we, we learn everything that we need to learn and we get it right and that we incorporate the lessons coming out of uh, Artemis 1 and 2 um, in preparation for future flights. That's, Thank that's you, That's all Sheila. I have. Thanks. That's a great, great overview. Um, next up is Christy Edwards. She's the Deputy Exploration Systems Architect for Lockheed Martin Corporation and uh, Today, for the first time, we met in person, but over the past several months, we've been spending a lot of time on Zoom calls because she's been a great help to us in preparing our Humans to Mars report on architectures for preparing to go to Mars with humans. And I just wanted to thank her for that. Uh, it's great to meet her in person finally. So, Christy, over to you. For, uh, she'll, she'll tell us a little bit more about Orion. Thank you. Um, so from the Orion perspective, um, this is really exciting times to be coming up on this launch. Um, we will be learning a lot about deep space operations with Orion in the next two missions. Um, Orion will be carrying astronauts uh, to the moon since uh, the first time since Apollo. And these astronauts are like very much like you and me. I think that there are a couple of um, my uh, classmates from college who just recently joined the astronaut corps, and they could potentially be on these missions. So it's just really exciting, these early missions, it's just really exciting that um, we could be, uh, that, we're, that we're taking humans back to the moon. Yep. Um, there are other things that, uh, that we'll be learning from these missions. Uh, we'll learn more about the radiation environment and its effects on crew. Um, we'll also learn more about how to operate in deep space with crewed missions. Um, I used to be on a, in a flight control room for Mars missions and for one moon missions. And, um, and I felt like in that flight control room, it was like a dance between the ground controllers and the onboard flight software. And that we were coordinated in that dance to fly these missions um, semi-autonomously around these other planetary bodies. And when you in, add crew into the mix, then the crew joins the tango, and it's a dance between <laughs> all three. And it's just when you figure out, as you get that experience uh, with these kinds of missions and, and incorporate the crew and, and get more and more experience in how it all works together, that dance becomes better and better, and we get to um, perform even um, more interesting missions with the crew involved, including landing on the moon. So it's very exciting to be part of these missions. Um, so let's see the next one. There we go. Um, so we have hardware. We have a spaceship yes. <laughs> ready to launch down in Florida. It's so exciting to be to see this flight coming up. Um, whenever I joined the Orion program, I was so excited um, to be part of a mission going to the moon. Um, and I just long or I look forward to seeing that that image of the Earth rising from the moon's surface, or rising beyond, just beyond the moon's surface, yeah. the Earth rise uh, right. picture, I look forward to seeing that from Orion to say, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so as part of my team, we've been looking at future architectures and uh, what those architectures could look like for both moon missions on the surface and lunar, cislunar space, and then also Mars missions. And this is one of our concepts for a Mars mission. It is the Mars Base Camp. Um, and uh, our Mars Base Camp concept goes between the gateway at the moon to Mars and then back, taking the crew uh, in that transit. And then it, while at Mars, it orbits Mars, and the crew can do sortie missions down to the surface to various Mars moons. And so the Orion is incorporated into this concept as the um, command center um, for uh, controlling all the spacecraft. So it's like the computer brains of the whole mission. And so we're incorporating the knowledge that we gained from the lunar missions into the Mars mission to help enable the crew to become more and more autonomous as that we go push further and further into deep space. Also, the Orion is sized for high-speed reentry yes. from deep space, Mars. so it can be used as a uh, contingency scenario for these Mars missions to take, bring the crew back in case um, they need to return from a, like a more ballistic trajectory. 
Um, so I was attending um, Humans to Mars last year uh, virtually, and my son, who's six years old, was listening to the presentations with me, some of the presentations with me, and he turned to me, he said, Mom, you want to go to the moon, and I want to go to Mars. Oh, <laughs> oh that's <laughs> great. It was so, it, it's just so much insight, because yes, we are returning to the moon, and um, we are in setting the stage, creating sustainable exploration, so that his generation, the generations to come, can go to Mars. And it's, we're just living in exciting times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. <laughs> so our next speaker is Dave Burks, uh, another colleague. Uh, Dave currently serves as Boeing's Director of Business Development for Deep Space. He's an Air Force veteran, and his career in aerospace has encompassed a broad spectrum of projects from DOD shuttle missions launch vehicle guidance systems to space physics at NASA headquarters and working on national security satellite systems design and development. So over to you, Dave, to tell us a little bit more about our SLS vehicle. Which means I've done a lot of things and don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Keep passing around. And apparently I can't get the slides to change. Oh. Could you pull up Dave's slides back there, guys? Thank you. Oh, oh. now they're going. Oh. <laughs> and can I brief them in reverse order? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dave. And done. <laughs> that was great. He's done a lot. <laughs> Could we go back to the first slide there, guys, and that set? We kind uh -huh. of. Yeah, this, this should be good. Okay, you're uh, good. Okay, it, there we go. Change it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the space launch system. So it's the uh, the rather large uh, rocket that uh, we're using for uh, Artemis one and two, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, and tell you a little bit about uh, about where we're going with it in the future. And uh, by the time we are going for Mars missions, it's uh, going to be even bigger than it is uh, today, more capable. So the rocket was designed from the ground up uh, as a deep space uh, rocket. It's uh, not designed to go to low, low Earth orbit. It's designed to just go and keep on going. So in one single launch, it takes you completely out of Earth's gravity well and, and can get you to, to anywhere in the lunar vicinity, to uh, the Lagrangian points. Uh, it can take you to Mars. It can take you to Jupiter. It can take you to the outer planets and beyond and it can get you there faster than anything else. It's built for power, it's built for speed, and it's built for distance. And you know, as, as you start thinking about it, uh, and I know you guys are thinking about Mars, but I'll start, start from the, the lunar part. You know, we've been going to the, uh, to the International Space Station for a while. If the International Space Station, if you think about that as, as a drive uh, across town, say uh, three miles or so, the equivalent of going to the moon is going from Los Angeles to New York, right? It's a lot further. So you need a rocket that can get you there. So a little bit of the uh, performance of this rocket. Uh, so the first version, the one that's sitting out on the pad right now, and is, uh, is uh, about 27 metric tons uh, to uh, the lunar vicinity. And so that's enough to uh, take uh, take the Orion spacecraft and service module, which weigh roughly 27 metric tons these days, uh, all the way to the moon and back. By the time we're going to Mars, you're gonna see that second version out there. So that's the Block 1B version. And then there's a Block 2, and, uh, and Mary and uh, Mike are gonna talk a little bit more about, uh, about some of those, uh, those uh, developments, I think. But as, as we go forward, the Block, uh, block 1B is going to be about 42 metric tons to translunar injection. So this is all the way up out of the gravity well, all the way onto the moon uh, with a, a huge payload. And we're talking about the size. So if you look uh, right now, we have a, uh, a vehicle that's compatible with the uh, heritage fairings. Uh, from the uh, Delta IV program, and that's what you see with the uh, 1X, so that's a five meter fairing by uh, 19 meters uh, tall. So if you start thinking about uh, taking uh, large quantities or, or a very heavy payload, you really wanna, wanna up the volume uh, because it, it's, a, it's a question of density. So uh, we actually have uh, in the plans an 8.4 meter diameter payload uh, that's uh, 27 meters uh, tall. And then by the time we're uh, going to Mars, we're planning on having a 10-meter uh, 
diameter payload uh, fairing that uh, is a roughly uh, 32 meters tall. So that's a huge volume. It's essentially six times the volume of uh, what we're currently flying today on the uh, heavy lift vehicles uh, of uh, like Delta IV heavy. And then the last thing you see on the, over on the right is uh, we have a co-manifest capability on top of uh, the uh, Block 1B vehicle. So you won't see it on the one that's on the pad right now. One that's on the pad has a launch vehicle stage adapter, and on top of that, you'll see the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, and then the Orion uh, vehicle with service module on top of that. When we go to the Block 1B vehicle, and the Block 1B vehicle is coming pretty soon. It's, yeah. it's in the Artemis IV time frame. And that vehicle will have an area underneath the Orion uh, vehicle and service module that's uh, about, uh, about 10 meters tall, 8.4 meters in diameter, and we can co-manifest uh, 10 to 12 metric tons. So whenever we're taking the Orion vehicle with, uh, with that new, new uh, configuration of SLS, we can take things along with us. We can take logistics modules. We can take, we can take uh, habitats. We can take all kinds of interesting stuff with us. So that's a really uh, incredible capability that, uh, that this rocket's gonna bring to the table. So kind of uh, where we are with it, I uh, wanna make sure that everybody understands that uh, this is real hardware, it's out there, it's on the pad. So um, Boeing builds the core stages and the uh, upper stages uh, for, for this vehicle. Uh, the uh, first core stage is complete, delivered. Uh, it is at Kennedy Space Center and uh, has been integrated with the solid rocket boosters. But I also want to point out that this isn't just a one and done thing. We are actually core stages uh, two, three, and four are well along into production. Uh, core stage two, in fact, is, is all joined. You would actually look at uh, that stage and say that it, it looks almost finished if uh, you went down to the machine assembly facility and took a look at it these days. So the program is moving along. And this is kind of what we've been doing at Kennedy Space Center for, um, I think it's been a little bit more than a year now. Yeah. Um, so I won't go through uh, all the details, but essentially it started with the uh, stacking of the solid rocket boosters uh, back in step one uh, on this chart and uh, has gone all the way through uh, putting all the pieces together that we had tested before and brought to the launch site and uh, uh, culminating in uh, putting the Orion vehicle and service module on top and so it's all there. It's actually uh, been out to the pad. We've done a couple of wet dress rehearsals, uh, and uh, we have uh, at least one more wet dress rehearsal. Wet dress rehearsals are all about finding all the little bugs in the ground systems that, uh, that you haven't seen before. I uh, want to make sure everybody understands the rocket is, is in great shape. It's actually been tested uh, before. We went through a green run, hot fire of, of this system, and it, everything looked great right down the middle. So. So we're actually really getting excited about this uh, vehicle flying uh, literally in just a few months. And there's the, uh, the money shot uh, <laughs> of uh, the vehicle on the pad, uh, complete with the uh, NASA logo on the uh, solid rocket booster. I picked this one because it kind of has Mars colors in the background. Wow. So. Very good, very good. <laughs> And then my last chart is just a reminder that uh, this is uh, what you guys are uh, hearing all about is, uh, is to go take people to Mars. Thank you, Dave. All right, thanks very much. So, so work. It next start. up is Barry Collegian. She was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and we've been lucky enough to have her working for us for the last five years at Aerojet Rocketdyne there in our LA plant. Um, the thing I love about her bio is she graduated from California State University, Los Angeles, where she got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. But that wasn't enough, so she also got a bachelor's degree in astrophysics. And so as I say, we're very lucky to have her working for us, and she's now working supporting the RS-25 program for the Space Launch System. So I'm gonna let her tell you what an RS-25 is. That's right, thank you so much. Um, so let's start off with my name, Mary Kalajian. I am supporting RS-25 engine hardware. I currently support the fabrication and development of RS-25 engine hardware. And I'm very excited here uh, to be uh, speaking at this wonderful summit. 
and uh, excited to tell you guys about uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne's involvement in NASA's Space Launch System rocket. So before I kick things off, I want to put you guys, you know, I want to give you guys a little bit of perspective. So what we're looking at here is, is Earth. We're looking at a picture of Earth uh, taken from <laughs> Mars by the Curiosity rover. And the ultimate goal is to have the same photo taken by a human. And we believe that that is possible with Aerojet Rocketdyne propulsion. Now, let me give you a little bit of history as to why, you know, Aerojet Rocketdyne. We've been around for a while. We've got some history. We've got, we've got, you know, some past things that we've worked on. We've had a hand in so many exploration missions that we've visited every planet in the solar system. So Mars, nothing new. Um, <laughs> we, um, we've supported missions uh, like Apollo. We've supported spacecraft like Voyager 1 and 2. Um, We've even supported you know, rovers like Spirit and Perseverance. So we've always powered mankind's curiosity. And we will continue. I see what you did there. You got it, you got it. It's another rover, right, okay. So, um, well, Dave just told you about you know, the SLS and why it's so great. Um, it's a very versatile uh, rocket. It's capable of evolving. It's got you know, flexibility in what kind of missions we want to do with it. So it could be used for exploration missions. It could be used for scientific research. We can send anything and everything we need. Astronauts, um, you know, equipment, uh, telescopes. Um, it also has three times the lift capability of any other commercial vehicle, and it can send humans into deep space. So how is Aerojet Rocketdyne supporting SLS? We're supporting SLS by providing the RS-25 core stage engines. Uh, you can see in that photo in the top left, those four beautiful uh, little <laughs> engines there. Each one provides about 500,000 pounds of force. Um, so we're ready to go. Uh, that background uh, image with the rainbow, that's a single engine test. Uh, you know taking place underway there. And then that center uh, smaller photo is the RS-25, a single engine in the test stand. So the RS-25 and the SSME, or the Space Shuttle main engine, they have a combined 1.1 million seconds of testing. And what that means is that it is the most reliable liquid engine on Earth. Now, I mentioned the SSME, or the Space Shuttle main engine, and RS-25 in the same breath because um, they are quite similar in the, in the fact that the RS-25 is a retrofit SSME, but so much has changed and improved since SSME. So what's new? What's the RS-25? The RS-25, what we did was we looked at ways where we could optimize the manufacturing while keeping the same reliability that we have with these engines. Um, so we've looked at ways to reduce welds. We've looked at ways to um, reduce piece parts. And one of the ways we're doing that is by utilizing additive manufacturing. Something else that's changed since um, Space Shuttle is our operating levels. So engines were operating at 100%, crawling up to 104%. Now we're operating at 109, and we will eventually be ramping up to 111%. Um, certification testing is taking place at the end of the year, which will certify our design configurations. And I also want to note that Aerojet Rocketdyne has spent $60 million in upgrading our facilities in Los Angeles, which is our RS-25 site, in order to accommodate for our growth. So RS-25 is just one of the products that we supply for SLS. We're also supplying the RL-10 upper stage. The RL-10 upper stage kicks in once we hit space. That's when these kind of shine. So in the upper left, we've got an RL-10 engine test, and below that, we have five assembled RL-10s ready to go. To the right of that, we have an RL-10 um, mated with the uh, ICPS, or the Interim Cryogenic uh, Propulsion System. And above that, we have four uh, RL-10s in the exploration upper stage. Now, we're not starting off with four. SLS will be ramping up. Newer generations will have the upgraded four. With one, we have about 25,000 pounds of force. With the four, we will have about 100,000 pounds. And this engine, you know, it's been around for a while. We had its first successful flight in 1963, and we're very happy and proud to have this product on it as well. Now let's dive into Orion and how Aerojet Rocketdyne is providing for Orion. Um, let's start with the launch abort system. We have one jettison motor on the launch abort system, which pulls the launch abort system away from the spacecraft after a safe launch. 
Moving on to the crew module, we have 12 MR-104s, uh, which are reaction control system thrusters. Moving on to our European service module, we have one Orion main engine, which powers the spacecraft. And then we have eight R4011 um, auxiliary engines. So that gives us a grand total of 22 aerogyro rocketdyne propulsion systems on Orion alone, which is a testament to how involved we are with this program. Um, next up, I have a video uh, that's gonna show you guys the RS-25s in action. So I don't know if it's gonna work if I click, so let's see what happens. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Play. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh oh. We're going. Maybe we'll go to the. I, I know they have the video, so I'm yeah, just going to be the patient video ready here. Yeah, they have the video to go, I think. <laughs> Thanks, by the way, Mary. <laughs> that was a great explanation of all the various places were involved and I really like how you uh, exceeded my introduction by telling about more than just the RS-25. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, we have, we have more than just the RS-25. Yeah. More oh, than just a pretty face. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, that's right. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I always like how fast these guys work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Real time. And the photos. And the wiggle there. The, That's the gimbal, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the mating down mm -hmm. in uh, the VAB yeah. and the rollout. Wow, that's beautiful. So basically, to wrap things up, as we know now, the sky is definitely not the limit. And uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne is definitely prepared to power the nation's mission to Mars. So, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I'm getting goosebumps, and I work there. <laughs> I don't know if I want to follow yeah. that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and follow. we're done. So, last but not least, <laughs> my good friend Mike Fuller uh, from Northrop Grumman. Mike has more than 16 years with Northrop Grumman. He's worked over the last year as director of their advanced programs. Previously, uh, for seven years, he was focused on NASA programs looking at human and robotic missions. So over to you, Mike, to take us home. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by the, uh, the presentations before, uh, before me. You guys did a, an awesome job, and hopefully I can uh, um, at least bring up the rear a little bit here. Right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so I'm from Northrop Grumman. Um, we actually currently manufacture the, uh, actually, we'll just, the, that was the intro slide that I'm required to have on all on Northrop Grumman uh, presentations, so we'll just go beyond that. Um, so Artemis 1, Artemis 2, um, our primary focus right now on SLS is we actually manufacture the boosters, as you can see on the, the picture on the right during the uh, rollout for wet dress. Um, the, the large white rockets on those are the, uh, the SLS boosters. They're a, a derivative of the uh, space shuttle solid rocket motors. We've actually taken those, extended them for uh, additional performance for the main vehicle. Uh, they're produced out in Utah, and we have um, casts, uh, as they said, cast made it and ready for launch for Artemis One. Uh, they started, as Dave kind of talked about earlier, they were about done about a year ago, uh, been sitting on the pad and uh, waiting for uh, waiting for the rest of the vehicle to, to come together and to, uh, to roll out and get ready for uh, launch. Um, those motors are significantly upgraded from what we did in, in the shuttle days. So we obviously have that history of over 30 years of uh, flying on the shuttle. Uh, we bring that history to the space launch system and we're, we're excited and, and, and proud of that heritage and of the, uh, the reliability that brings. Uh, these are upgraded, as I said, they're, they're five segment uh, boosters. They produce about three and a half million pounds of thrust each. Um, so at liftoff, we are providing over 80% of the uh, liftoff thrust of the, of the vehicle and provide that for the first two minutes of the ascent. Um, it's not a long part of the mission, but it's a key part of the mission, Critical. getting us up out of the gravity well to allow the, uh, uh, the core stage in Orion to, to go those places that they need to go. Uh, in addition, um, Mary alluded to the, uh, the Orion uh, launch abort system. Uh, Northrop Grumman has actually produces two of the rocket motors that are associated with the launch abort system as well. Um, the main launch abort motor, so if, uh, if 
the unthinkable happens and the astronauts need to get away from the, uh, the vehicle in some incident, uh, the launch abort motor will fire. It's about 400,000 pounds of thrust for about three and a half seconds. It pulls the Orion capsule up and away from uh, the vehicle, providing the astronauts a safe um, exit from the vehicle vicinity. In addition, on the, the very tip of the launch abort system, there is a, uh, an attitude control motor. So it's actually a <coughs> valved solid rocket motor that sits on the very front. It has, um, I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna get it wrong, but it has eight valves on it, basically eight ports, and they're valves so that you can provide differential thrust and be able to actually, as the vehicle is, the Orion vehicle is coming off, you can turn it around so that the heat shield is forward and the parachute is aft. So we're very proud of the, uh, the effort we put involved in that and being, being a, um, uh, a partner with NASA and with the rest of the uh, SLS team to, to provide that capability for, uh, for the country. Um, as for Artemis II, uh, our boosters are stacked and in the, uh, as we call them, in the barn, waiting for NASA to give us the go ahead to ship those down to Kennedy for the, uh, for the integration for the Artemis II launch. And we are also under contract from uh, Lockheed Martin to get those, the launch abort system uh, motors prepped and ready to go. And we're just waiting for, waiting for those go-aheads. So if we go to the next slide in the future, as we continue on, we talked about the upgrades to, uh, the upgrades that'll happen to the space launch system. Uh, Dave mentioned SLS Block 1B. Beyond that is SLS Block 2, which is actually at the point when we run out of the heritage uh, case hardware for the SLS boosters. We will go to a, uh, a more modern composite case system with, uh, with more modern systems. Actually, if you guys want to click on the, uh, the link on Bole, um, it actually takes to, uh, we've actually done some of the initial work on that already, where we've done trial lines on a mandrel, being able to produce a 12-foot diameter composite segment, which is something that uh, uh, only recently we've uh, been able to get underway. I don't know, can you guys uh, click that link and go to that GIF? There we go. Oh, so this is actually part of the initial hardware. Now it's a GIF, it's gonna continue on forever and ever and they're not gonna get very <laughs> far. But, uh, but essentially it gives you an idea. And if you guys wanna pause that, can you click on that and pause it while the guy, oh, I guess not. Um, yeah, not so much. Well, anyway, in, in that traveling arm, there's actually a guy sitting at the very, uh, oh, up towards the front that you can, you can sort of see him in there yeah, if, you, yeah. if you catch him, mm -hmm. but it gives you kind of the sense of the scale. It's a, it's a very huge piece of composite material that we're actually putting together for, the, uh, uh, for that, and we're, we're excited to be on contract and be able to deliver that when it, uh, when it is necessary for the, uh, for the capabilities. Now, if you want to click on that, uh, there you go, get back in there. So in addition to the, uh, the work we do on SLS, we're actually involved as well in, in Gateway and prep for uh, human exploration at the lunar surface, as well as for the eventual um, Mars transit. So part of what we do, we actually provide um, the halo element for the first portion of the gateway um, vehicle that will be orbiting, um, uh, orbiting the moon in its time. Uh, that is actually a derivative of our current hardware that is delivering cargo to the space station. And part of what we, we hope to do, and you can actually see it's the picture behind, the, uh, behind those words, is actually a, uh, a shot of what they call the co-manifested vehicle, which is HALO and the PPE combined into one unit that will be launched up, hopefully, later next year. Uh, and so we're excited to do that. We're working with NASA as well to, to leverage the capabilities that we're producing with that, as well as to leverage the knowledge we're gonna gain in, the, uh, in that deep space environment to set us on the stage for uh, eventual Mars transit and be able to apply what we learn to, uh, to those techniques. So with that, that's all thanks, I have. Mike. I'll uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks to all of our panel. I think that's a wonderful overview for Artemis 1 and 2. So just to, just to get us started, I'm going to kick us off with a few questions here uh, for the panel. And then, as I said, uh, feel free to come up and uh, take your place at the mics if you have questions for us, too. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to ask, what's the plan for future SLS, uh, Block 1B and Block 2? So maybe, David, could you start off and give us a little bit of an overview about Block 1B? Sure. So uh, the basic difference between uh, Block 1 and Block 1B is the upper stage. So as Mary was talking about earlier, she was talking about the engines. Uh, where uh, Boeing is currently developing uh, the exploration upper stage 
exploration upper stage uh, goes from about 25,000 pounds thrust to, uh, to around 100,000 pounds thrust, has four engines on it. Uh, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, uh, ICPS, uh, is about five meters in diameter. Uh, the new upper stage is a beast. It's a huge thing. It's 8.4 meters in diameter, and, uh, and it provides a lot more capability. And so you're going, as I think I mentioned earlier, you're going from uh, being able to throw 27 metric tons to translunar injection to being able to throw uh, 42 to 45 tons uh, to translunar injection. And what that translates to for, for Mars is, I think it's uh, about 32 uh, metric tons to uh, translunar, to mm -hmm. Martian injection. So <laughs> it's a very capable system. And then I was going to turn it over to uh, Mike and let you talk about Block 2 a little bit. You, you alluded to it in your presentation. Right. So the Block 2, is, as I kind of talked about a little bit earlier, is really the, the evolution of the, uh, the solid rocket motors, where we go from um, the heritage systems associated with, uh, with the shuttle program and the current SLS booster, and we go to what they call BOLE, so booster obsolescence and life extension, where we're looking at what happens next and really taking uh, taking advantage of current modern techniques, modern uh, composite materials, modern manufacturing methods, and um, uh, propellant types, and pulling them into a booster to re basically be a drop-in replacement for the current SLS booster. Um, in doing so, you actually get a significant uh, increase in performance. Uh, right now, we are we're on contract to deliver uh, at least three metric tons of additional performance to TLI. Um, based on some of the initial runs, we're looking to get significantly more than that. Um, but again, we're working through, working with NASA and, pro and looking to introduce that in the Artemis 9 timeframe is when that would, uh, that would fly. So we get EUS on Artemis 4 and uh, BOLE uh, improvements for Block 2 type improvements on Artemis 9. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Um, how about the RS-25s, Mary? What, what kind of improvements are we planning on for those? Right, so for the RS-25, um, our target for the future is we're gonna be focusing on affordability. Um, that's because future missions are calling for expendable engines. And so we're taking a look at optimizing our manufacturing processes while maintaining the same level of reliability. So um, one of the things that I had mentioned was um, additive manufacturing. So that's definitely one of the things that we're focusing on. And you know, for example, with our uh, additive manufactured POGO accumulator, we've um, gotten rid of over 20 piece parts, we've gotten rid of over 100 welds, and we've reduced the lead time by 50%. And so that's one example of you know, what we're focusing on. Got it. Yeah. And, and some of that's already been tested in the yeah. retrofit testing that you showed in there, right? Exactly. The, yes. the POGO accumulator has already been incorporated into an engine and fired for a full duration. Yes. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not just a theoretical improvement. Yeah, <laughs> exactly.